are we we are ready to begin. Welcome to the sixth event in the series towards another architecture. This has been organised by the Farrell Centre, a new public centre for architecture and cities in Newcastle in the UK, in collaboration with the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at Newcastle University. Now, as this is the sixth event in the series, and, I, and I'm sure some of you have, have been to certainly more than one of the previous ones, you're all familiar with my uh, preamble. So I'll give a sort of condensed version of it as a way of just framing the brief that we've put to our speakers. The starting point is the realization it's now 100 years since the first essays that were later formed, Le Corbusier's Vers in Architecture, were published in L'Esprit Nouveau. Um, and today uh, we are uh, at another pivotal moment for architecture and for the wider world. And the series emerges from the contention that to make sense of this moment, what we need is not a new architecture, as Le Corbusier uh, was popularly mistranslated as advocating, but another one. An architecture is not bound to a single vision, but is diverse, pluralist, and sustains multiple conversations about the active role that architects might play in the world. So the format uh, is a very simple one. It's a 30 minute presentation followed by 30 minutes Q&A. So please do have your questions ready. Two weeks ago, we heard from the Budapest based practice Paradigma Ariadne, who explored their work across a range of media uh, that interrogates architectures past, present and future. And this evening, I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Kabaga Karanha and Stella Matei, who are co-founders of Nairobi-based Cave Bureau. And um, I'll just, just read out how they describe their work on their website. It addresses um, and works to decode both anth anthropological and geological contexts of the post-colonial African city, explored through drawing, storytelling, construction, and the curation of performative events of resistance. The Bureau is driven to develop systems and structures that improve the human condition without negatively impacting the natural environment and social fabric of communities. And by conducting playful and intensive research studies into caves within and around Nairobi, they aim to navigate a return to the limitless curiosity of our ancestors while confronting the challenges of contemporary rural and urban living. Their work has been exhibited internationally, including at last year's Venice Architecture Biennale, where their installation, Obsidian Rain, a, tr a transposed section of the Mbai Cave in Kenya, was by all accounts, for those who attended the Biennale, one of the, the real highlights. So please uh, welcome uh, Kabaga and Stella. Over to you. Maggie, you're muted. Sorry. Yes, can you hear and see my screen? We can, yes. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Owen. Um, thank you, uh, Farah Center, Newcastle University. Thank you for inviting us uh, in this. Uh, engaging subject towards another architecture. Um, for this lecture, Stella and I hope to predominantly focus on uh, our project that uh, consumes much of our research, the Anthropocene Museum. And um, we are tuning in from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, it's at night here, <laughs> pretty late. Uh, but with that said, we're, we're really excited. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. So I'll just go straight in. So I hope to just uh, read a short extract of one of our essays that we wrote on EFLUX, which uh, allows us to sort of walk in, into the cave a bit more um, clearly and in a visceral way. So in our opinion, architecture really always existed ever since the birth of Earth four and a half billion years ago, even further to when the vast masses of hot gas and matter rammed through space and time, pulled in by gravitational forces, framing spaces and cavities, caves indeed, that eventually settled over millennia 
It was through the movement of rocky masses around the endless number of suns that tectonic shifts within planets of rock melting lava flows afforded the formation of spaces of shelter for living things to thrive. All humans from our furthest distant hominin relatives, the Sahelanthropus Tachdenus, almost 8 million years ago to our very own quarter of a million old Homo sapiens species, share this architectural heritage from civilizations oral and recorded histories of religious revelations to philosophical metaphors and narratives and as surface and as a surface to embed our cultural thoughts and values across cave walls all having formed an intrinsic part of our past present and soon to be future so these uh, two drawings, uh, drawings and works that we uh, presented for a museum critique project, and uh, they are composed of um, a few factual uh, representations on the northern parts of Kenya to do with our, our history and our archeological history to do with uh, the earliest finds of our species, but more so also intertwining that with the local heritage and spirituality. So as, as the name states, we are Cave Bureau and we do focus on cave research, uh, but more so looking at caves that have a more recent and more so reference to the 20th century uh, impact to do with how they were inhabited by our ancestors. And we begin to look at these spaces effectively as museums in a natural state as a way to critique um, the colonial state um, that we, we emerged from and our ability to resist that. And this is one such cave where the freedom fighters, the Mau Mau, would reside, a beautiful, really intimate, small cave. Uh, at the nave here, the Mau Mau freedom fighters uh, would light their fires. And I think it, it stretches further back. Um, to do with the Plato's allegory of the cave um, about the philosophical emergence of um, humankind, should we say, from caves and our ability to, to use our thought and thinking to quite, uh, quite precisely emerge from this so-called dark state um, of our minds um, and moving into a sort of state of enlightenment, so to speak. However, uh, that sort of emergence has resulted in a space we're in with the Anthropocene in context. We, we have actually, uh, in many parts, caused huge environmental catastrophes into our biosphere. And um, in turn, we question if our emergence from the caves should in fact be reversed to return back to the cave to contemplate our, our civilization or lack of it for that matter. Now, um, we, we do look at different caves around, um, around Kenya and we hope to look at many more and possibly um, go out into Africa and probably into the rest of the world until we've, you know, had a chance to really study and focus a lot of our research on these caves. And this photo you're looking at is one such time. Um, this was in January of last year. We were in Shimoni Caves. Shimoni Caves were um, slave caves or are caves that um, held slaves. Um, in the 17th, 16th century. And um, we usually go to these caves and we um, get the local community and talk to them um, about what the caves mean to them, looking at the past, looking at the current situation they're in and what they see the future um, of those caves uh, being. And usually we come out with a wealth of information and uh, information that's not readily known, it's not published, it's with the communities. And we hope that um, in time we'll be able to tell these stories so that um, you know, the world gets to know 
what happens in, in some of these caves, some of the atrocities that have happened, some of the environmental issues that they're going through um, because of the different things that happen in the different caves. Um, apart from that um, exploration of caves, uh, it may not look like it, but we're actually a conventional and traditional architectural practice. Um, we go to site, we yell at contractors, we yell at engineers for not issuing drawings, we talk to this um, council for approval of drawings. So in many respects, yes, we are architects and um, yeah, we, we do architectural work alongside the research that we do. And we are a very small practice. Um, we've but um, young architects that work with us, they come, go, um, get more, come, go. But um, yeah, we, we really encourage that even as they step out of school and get into the architectural world, that they don't just focus on architecture as it's taught in, um, in, in school. There's so many other aspects, like the research that we do. So yeah, that's us bit quirky, <laughs> but um, yeah, we have fun while we're doing all this. Um, so I think as mentioned, we'd be focusing on the Anthropocene Museum, but within the context of looking at architecture for an age of trauma, resistance and healing as a key backdrop to um, um, our work. So caves as geological structures and spaces are ingrained in our prehistoric consciousness. And for thousands of years, indeed millions of years, they have influenced the way we perceive and define the world around us. Humanity's early experience of inside and out, the nave, light wells, shafts, chambers, and echoes, among many other architectural experiences and features can be directly connected to our ancestors' encounter with caves and associated networks across the ages. Sorry, I think that was my slide, got a bit confused. But um, yeah, uh, one of the things that we do at CAVE is, is um, dissect the city. We look at the city and, um, and dissect it. And we dissect it and categorize it into three areas. Areas that we've called the void, um, the origin, and the made. And a lot of these um, spaces or categories in the city have come from the colonial era. And if you look at the image on your extreme left, that is an image of what we call the origin. And the origin is the land as it was before colonialism. It's um, the land that the colonialists came and found. But it is also where um, the people who are now in their 60s, 70s, 80s, currently in Kenya, um, this was the kind of life they had because they grew up during the colonial um, era. And for a lot of them, these were the first um, professionals, so to say, they were the first people that went to school, the first people that went to university, started work. So they are the first doctors, um, civil servants, um, architects and all that. And what they did is um, they migrated. At the time Kenya was getting high independence in 1963, they were in their early 20s um, starting their careers. So what they did is they migrated into the city. And when they migrated into the city, um, already they found the city had been segregated already by the, the British colonial government and the void uh, was created and the void is what you see in the middle um, photo. And the void currently is a place that's quite problematic. Um, it's very highly populated. It is um, sometimes referred to as informal settlement. Some areas of the void could be called slums, but we don't like to use that word, but um, a lot of the working population um, of the city comes from the void. And a lot of the people from the void are trying to work as hard as they can to get out of the void 
and go into the mid, which is the photo on your extreme right. Now, the mid is your more affluent areas of the city. It's the areas that were mostly inhabited by colonial um, officials, the settlers that came um, with the colonial government. These are the areas that they took. They were lush with vegetation, um, cooler in temperature, whereas the, the void would be more of a savanna landscape. So it's pretty hot. And then as you come to the mid areas, it's a bit more um, high in altitude. So of course, it's a bit cooler. And a lot of, um, like I said, people in the void are trying to get into the mid. And it's actually a cycle because we have now a lot of um, rural urban migration. In the rural, we'll call that the origin, that people in the rural areas are migrating into the urban centers. And when they land in an urban center like Nairobi, they will go into the mid because that's the only place they can um, afford. And they're all trying to work very hard to get into the mid. Of course, now the mid is made up of mostly affluent um, Kenyans. But um, with a struggle of you know, population growth and all that, the people in the maid, ironically, are now going back to the void where it is um, less populated. But of course, these are issues we then try and address even in, in the design work we do in the office. When we get projects, we categorize them and then try and solve whatever issues each of these categories have through design and dialogue with, um, with the communities and the people and the developers, the clients that we get. Kabage, you're on mute. Sorry for, sorry for that. So taking all that in, um, we look at the situation we find ourselves in, the proposed Anthropocene uh, epoch, as it has been defined, which has come to being as a result of mankind's impact on the world, um, to the detriment of many species. And um, they're complex issues, really, um, and broad issues, the discourse of which tends to not reside in the global south. And um, a lot of our research begins to question who should be brought on the table to talk about these complex issues, about one such thing as the International Chronostographic Chart, which identifies our age, where we are right now, being the Holocene, and the momentous transition to move into the Anthropocene, and what that all means as a result of uh, our impact on the planet. And in many respects, this has um, been critiqued to look at why we're calling it Anthropocene. Should it be the capital scene or the pla uh, plantation scene among others, like the Thule scene as well. But all of this trying to um, grapple with it, at least within our context and consider what it really means for a change in geological time. And as architects uh, dealing with uh, geological structures, as materials emerged from the earth and computed and sort of realized, um, it is quite pertinent and critical to look at that. And uh, for us, it's really interesting to look at when the proposed time changes. And it is right at the uh, mid 20th century, 1950, with a great acceleration. And that moment in time, which leaves the Holocene behind and moves into a sort of future uh, of, of man, or so to speak, as the Anthropocene is defined, um, or the age of man. And for us, at least, we look at uh, the colonial uh, situation and question, but more so the decolonial um, movements of resistance that took place right exactly. And that's almost across the global south where you had these freedom fighting movements and uh, moments in time which um, 
we humans, uh, or at least a number of humans, uh, questioned this age and this epoch. And so we reference a lot of um, great thinkers in this regard, from Franz Fanon to Amitav Ghosh, Edward Said, uh, the list goes on and on. More recently, Leslie Loco, um, to actually uh, critique uh, this time interval, but more so to also look at the modern movement, uh, which if you look at it in detail, um, in, in architecture, it appeared to deny the primacy of language and representation as a core of the architectural paradigm in preference for the new orthodoxy of the international style. So the modern movement was subsequently developed and projected around the world in the first half of the 20th century at precisely the moment when the colonial machinery was at, it, as its most, at its most efficient, decimating the cultural means of resistance. That's one extract from Leslie Loco's book, White Papers, Black Marks. If none of you have read it, I would recommend you do. But um, I think we locally, we look at also working with artists. Um, Osborne Masharia produced this work, which is the Wives of the Mau Mau Freedom Fighters. And it's, it's a beautiful piece, which imagines um, uh, the, the wives of the Mau Mau because during these moments of resistance, women and children were part of the struggle. And um, his depiction of, 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 of the women uh, are quite, quite heroic and, and, and beautiful. And many artists as well have, have grappled with these subjects. But at the heart of it, we look at the museums, which have struggled uh, really as warehouses of stolen loot one questions, um, how does the museum confront its dark, dark past? You know, and how do we begin to, to project a way forward? And I think these are questions we feel um, here in Kenya, we, we are in the right place to ask and in the right um, position to consider what, what does it all mean? Um, but beyond that, uh, putting architecture squarely as, as an agent, uh, and the center of it, when you look at how the history of architecture has been defined, and in, in this instant, at least stating within a period, uh, at least within the 1950s, of proposing uh, inserting uh, the caves and one specific cave within this global history um, repository as a way to uh, begin to open up a much broader dialogue about architecture in its functions, because we used these caves in their architectural uh, capacity to, to shelter and, and hide the resistance. And it was very much an architectural act, uh, which we find and begin to map and draw up. So beyond that, within the Anthropocene Museum, there are specific sites we work on and look into, Suswa Mountain, the Shimoni Caves, where Stella highlighted, we do engage with the community to look in a lot of detail. This one site, the um, Suswa Mountain, quite a beautiful location where we often question what architects tend to look at and, and, and imagine a, a space to insert um, a piece of architecture. Uh, but for us, it's many, in many respects, the contrary. Um, would hope this space never has uh, the ravages of architectural <laughs> hands being laid on it, as difficult as it is, because it is a beautiful site for what it's worth, just as it is. Um, but more disturbingly, I think, if you look uh, much closer to this site uh, in Suswa, geothermal energy extraction is a uh, commonplace. Unfortunately, it's extracted to the detriment of the environment and the community at large, even if it is uh, a green energy, um, which has really allowed Kenya as a country to perform really well, where almost 90% of Kenya's energy on the grid is green, uh, something that's not really spoke about very much, or at least uh, splashed in the media. 
but with that said, we feel we also have the agency to critique this most um, uh, most complex uh, energy extraction mode, where these chambers and sites are within a game park in Naivasha, close to Susua Mountain. And unfortunately, it has resulted in a lot of species um, escaping from, from the site because of these plumes of steam, as well as the noise, noise and the smells. And so as part of um, the Anthropocene Museum 1.0, which we exhibited at the Smithsonian Museum um, in New York, we gathered together um, a sort of repository of, of facts about the impact of uh, the geothermal energy extraction and looking at ways to resist uh, with the help of the community, ways to resist and highlight the problem. You see uh, two species. The first, it's a feral eagle, um, an owl eagle specifically. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, to do with the two species in the middle. At the bottom is the um, giant mastiff bat, which is under threat um, when you look at the context of Suswa and the government's plan to exploit geothermal energy extraction uh, along this corridor. And as well as highlighted the, this eagle owl, which has uh, actually been identified as a species that has moved away from the Naivasha area where the geothermal activity is taking place. On the right is the baboon and uh, part of the Suswa caves we analyze, uh, there is a cave called the baboon parliament where baboons actually reside and use their, uh, sorry about that. Um, we're, we're having some power issues here. <laughs> but I'll just continue. Uh, I hope you, you gathered most of what I mentioned. Um, so on this next slide, it is a, a bronze model. Part of the work we do is scanning the caves and actually working with the community to consider what um, these caves mean in deep time, as well as recently. And so we, using uh, 3D scanning technology, scan the caves, um, get 3D molds out of them to broadcast as a representation at scale to do with these caves. So we treat them as artifacts in many ways. Um, beyond that, we look at um, the caves geometries, compare them to ancient uh, pieces of architecture or more should I say classical in reference, like the Rome's Pantheon, with this one cave, the Baboon Parliament, which we found to be of almost similar nature in scale uh, to uh, the, the, this architectural piece. Um, but obviously, this Baboon Parliament predating um, this classical piece of architecture by millennia. And so one of the things um, that um, we look at, for instance, when we went to Shimoni, like I'd mentioned earlier, is the history of those caves and um, what the community, um, how the community relates with the past, the present, and what they foresee as the future. So at Shimoni, um, these are caves that are off the Indian Ocean, um, in the east coast of, of, of Kenya. And um, they were used as holding caves for slaves. So they were captured from the mainland, brought to these caves, chained there as they waited for the ship to travel down the Indian Ocean coast, picking up slaves and taking them down to, to Zanzibar. Zanzibar was the largest slave market um, on the East Coast. And from there, the slaves either worked in the spice plantations in Zanzibar or they were shipped off to the Middle East um, to work there. And one of the things, of course, we find is that 
a lot the world mostly knows about the West African transatlantic um, slave trade, and not so much is known about the Indian Ocean um, East Coast um, slave trade. So that's something we hope uh, we can and Earth talk about it some more. Um, we, while we were there, we found that there were some escape routes that the slaves used, um, those who were fortunate to escape. And those obviously over time, silt has built up and, um, and covered them. And we hope to go and you know, talk to government, the locals, communities around to sort of unearth, go for a geological sort of uh, dig and find you know, more about the history of, of these caves. So this is an, a cave, um, that's Shimoni, Shimoni Caves. And like I said before, we usually go there and engage with the community. So this is one of those sessions where we have sat down with um, one, one of the people that run, that run the cave apart from the community is the National Museums of Kenya. So these Shimoni slave caves are under the National Museums of Kenya, but also the community has a large stake in them because this is um, a part of their history. So we sit down with them and we discuss um, issues that affect them, issues that have come from their past, um issues that need to be resolved but they don't have an avenue to to address these issues with who to address them to um and so in this sort of community talks then we see how we can link up different stakeholders to answer some of the questions that they they ask us or they task us um with yeah and hopefully you know, at the end of all this, we we would want that the communities that live around this, these caves are, are well protected, um, that these caves that belong to them are well preserved for, for, for years to come, for their generations later on, that, you know, the stories that come from the past inform how we go into the future. Yeah, this is an image obviously showing um, the, the 3D scan that um, Kabage was talking about. We take scans of the, of the caves and uh, turn them into drawings. And one of the th um, things we found, the tunnel that we found actually connects to a set of caves we had never heard of. Um, they're called the Three Giant Sister Caves. Um, it's a series of three large caves uh, next to each other, and the locals call them um, giant sisters. And the tunnel that led from, from Shimoni um, caves, the slaves would then find a way through these tunnels and end up in the three giant sister caves. And that became a refuge for them. So it will be interesting um, for us and of course for the community and um, Kenya as a large to just, you know, unearth this tunnel and find what rich history, maybe very painful history, but our history regardless. Um, and it might tell a different story of what might have happened in these caves or how many people may have escaped or were they ever found, you know, it's, it's something we're excited about. And it's something we hope to be, um, to be starting soon, hopefully, rather than later. Uh, just need to reorganize our, our calendars. <laughs> yeah. So as part of all that research, we, um, also look back at our first iterations and obsidian rain um, was what we exhibited in Venice. And why we chose this project, because it was the first set of cave that we surveyed and it represents that first cave that um, historically speaking for us, um, bears a lot of weight and importance as a cave of resistance and Congress where the African state of the future, at least for Kenya's perspective, was crafted within this cave. And so as Stella highlights, we 3D scanned the cave, we modeled it, 
and uh, took a cross section of part of the cave. And now uh, one of our ideas was to transpose that section into Venice as a space of Congress and, and discussion that we would have there. But because of the pandemic, we weren't able. Um, but using um, the current data that we extracted of the cave, we found it was possible to, to actually imagine that cave there. And this was one of the first drawings we submitted. Um, and very quickly, the curators thought it would be perfectly suited to fit in the Galileo Cini Dome um, in, in, in Venice, uh, the Giardini. And um, this obviously being a transposed section of the cave, albeit through a um, number of about a thousand obsidian stones lowered at the exact point cloud heights from the scans that would effectively be a roof over within the dome. And um, so we used uh, the geometry, the hexagonal geometry of the dome as, as supports, but without touching the dome itself, because it's, it's a protected uh, building and unfortunately still crumbling as well. But we wanted to feel and make it part of the, the structure, which took a lot of engineering with um, the timber LVLs, um, which um, was extracted from a Scandinavian forest. So part of the argument was that to limit its carbon footprint, we wanted a, a structure that is of a timber that could be reused. And it was only the stones that we would uh, ship from Kenya. And these being obsidian stone um, as the first tool if you'd call it a material that actually transcended us to where we are as a so-called civilization, all really began with obsidian. And it's a material that is not a precious stone. It's not particularly um, attractive to some people, but to us, it's, it's uh, one of the most beautiful and most precious materials when you look at the historical context of it. And that's why we call it obsidian rain. Um, one of the key things was to highlight the, the grand uh, the fresco of the Chini Dome, um, but composing our bronze models and leather drawings across the room. And I think beyond that, in our most recent iteration of the Anthropocene Museum is the Maasai Cow Corridor. Um, a project that we um, were invited to exhibit or at least talk about in Dizine's uh, 15th birthday last year, uh, getting the opportunity to talk about a project that is quite dear to our hearts, specifically to do with animal husbandry that is painted on cave walls around the world. As one might be aware, um, animal husbandry dates back uh, further than the pyramids of Egypt as an ancient, um, ancient uh, practice that um, is very much common and was common around the world. But in Africa and specifically Kenya, it is still very much part a livelihood. If you'd call it free range cattle um, herding, uh, it is what it is. Um, we tend to have the Maasai community who are uh, a big community in, in not only in Kenya, but in other um, East African countries, they still herd their cattle. But unfortunately, uh, due to challenges of, of space and land that has been either sold by them or taken over by the government, they find it hard to find uh, grazing pastures. And so our proposal was to look at uh, this need that's perceived to be a, a problem for the city, but that one we can uh, engineer into the grain of the mundane infrastructure as a way to alleviate the ancient um, practices of the Maasai community. And so in a bit to find out more about um, the Maasai and the problems that they 
they're going through currently. We we spoke to Emily um, and Dorcas, who's in white. Emily's in the blue outfit. And these are Maasai's who live in a place called Birika. Birika is in the outskirts of uh, Nairobi city. And um, <clears throat> we drove there and we, we spoke to them and we were asking, we were asking them what the difference is between when they were young girls and they had a cattle for their dads and now how their children um, are living as Masa is in, a, in an era that, you know, um, a lot of their land has been sold off to private people who have then fenced off and, you know, they have signs saying no trespassing private property. And so this has become a big problem for the Maasai people because um, this was their grazing land. Even where Nairobi sits, Nairobi sits on ancestral Maasai grazing land. In fact, the word Nairobi in uh, Maasai language means a place of cool waters. So they would somehow end up um, in Nairobi. Um, where there was greener pasture, obviously, because there was, you know, it was swampy and there was water there. But um, for Dorcas and Emily right now, their animals don't have land to graze. And so they find that they walk really long distances. Sometimes they go into the national park um, where they get into conflict with the Kenya Wildlife Services, because obviously those are conservation areas. They are areas that have been set aside by government to uh, for the wild animals, but the Maasai need to feed their animals. And so it's, it's become very, they're actually redefining their way of life because for the Maasai cattle, cattle is their way of life. Animal husband, Rias Kabage has mentioned, is their way of life. It's been their way of life for millennia. And in their culture, the more animals you have, the more standing you have in society. But because of the reduced um, grazing lands, they have had to reduce the number of animals they keep um, and, you know, and start looking for other ways of life. And in fact, when we spoke to them, they were very clear that they didn't want this kind of life for their children. They want their children to go to school and um, go into college and get jobs and not had um, animals like they did. When they were growing up, it was, I mean, there was no question about it. You took the animals to, to graze, but now their children have an option, actually. It was Emily. I remember we were looking for the animals uh, when we went to visit and we walked hours and hours looking for them, obviously, because they've gone long distances. And sometimes Emily, um, has to go around, has to herd the animals because there's nobody else to do it. She won't let her children do it like her dad, um, her father made her do. And so in the cow corridor, we, we look at um, radical, call them, maybe not radical, let me not call it radical, but remedial remedial acts that we've called um, reverse futurism. So it's creating a restorative, uh, restorative artifice within the landscape of Fantamasgoria in, in Nairobi. And so what we do is we, we look at Nairobi um, as a city. We look at the the wetlands within Nairobi, the place where the Maasai actually came to graze um, their animals. Then we look at the infrastructure that has been put in place. Um, and then we also look at the patches of land that are belong to government or belong to government corporations that are not in use yet instead of the Maasai, you know, um, bustling around the city through traffic with their animals. These are areas that we feel or we propose um, could be used um, as places where Maasai from the outskirts would come back to these ancestral lands um, that has belonged to their people in, for millennia, come and 
make use of this direct leaked um, railway lands, um, lands that have been set aside for airports that are not going to be built. But these are lands that um, are fenced and are lush with grass that could actually benefit um, the Maasai people. So this was a proposal we had um, for what we presented to Dizin and we hopefully would like to see um, some sort of it um, put in place. And um, I think in the greater detail as you go and zoom in into the cow corridor, one of our thoughts was that we need to address some of key problems about uh, water scarcity. As much as we have rivers, a lot of them are contaminated. And um, one of the thoughts was to have rain collection um, follies in the landscape, um, but specifically looking and using uh, cave geometry, which we reversed and flipped around to actually in a mammary way, collect water um, that would trickle down and create um, oases for the cows, but uh, spaces as well that could attract uh, animals that are also going through very depressed times uh, to do with climate change, which have resulted in uh, uh, more drought seasons. And so part of the argument is to look to uh, create this artifice, as Stella said, to um, produce these landscapes and structures um, of, of earth and um, a sort of interesting ratio of concrete um, that will allow water collection in, in, in vast volumes in many respects, but also underground with reservoirs, but spaces of shade, spaces where the cows can uh, lick walls to get their salt um, um, quarters, um, and also cattle dips where the veterinarians can come and treat um, the free ranging cows of the Maasai people, but yet certain sections which uh, allow to, to, to get watering holes for both wild animals and, and cows. And I think beyond that is to think of the vast number of, of projects of infrastructure that are proposed to look to reverse some of the mistakes of modernism in terms of um, huge highways in the sky um, that traverse through cities only to just increase congestion. Uh, one of our thoughts was to really focus in on this Maasai cow corridor and allowing for spaces over time to be reclaimed for walking, for grazing, an interaction of both um, uh, domesticated animals and wild animals to roam, because they do roam within the city. There are many instances of, of lions breaking into the city, um, elephants walking through the streets. Um, one of the arguments is to why, why can't we allow this coexisting in, in a meaningful way? And uh, that was one of the key, <clears throat> key drivers of, of the Maasai Cow Corridor. And to, to conclude. And so we, we conceived what we call the Benevolent Reparations Institute or BRIT. And this would be an institute through which um, funds would be channeled. Um, of course, there's, there's a lot, a lot of atrocities that took place um, in Africa and I, I would say the global south. And it's hard to place um, a person or a community that um, was not affected. I think we were all affected to some point and up to today, um, even as we look at the cow corridor, that's one of the, of the issues that have come up that were brought up by colonialism. Um, Nairobi is, is bang in the middle of a place that the Maasai for millennia would come and, and um, get greener pastures and water for their animals. But when the British government colonized Kenya and they had this um, idea to, to bring the railway 
across from the ocean, Indian Ocean, right through across Nairobi, uh, across Kenya. Nairobi was a good place to stop. And when they stopped there, it became a place that was a train depot and it grew and it grew into what uh, we have now, a city with 7 million people um, as its population. So what we, the way we see it is um, it would be very hard, you know, to say, give Stella X amount of money because her great grandmother, this and this and this happened. Um, and there would be so many of those types of, um, of, of, um, of issues that would come up. And so what we thought is um, we could have communities across the 54 African nations would come up with projects, projects such as the cow corridor, for instance. And then these projects would um, be presented to a panel who would then um, decide from a community, you know, you'd go into a community and ask for um, ways or ideas or thoughts that they have to solve some of the colonial issues that they are going through right now. And through this sort of, um, of competitions that are presented as, as um, projects, one project would, would be chosen maybe from a series of them, and then money would be channeled through that, um, through the institute to, to fund these projects that would then go towards um, resolving. I don't know if resolving is actually the, the correct word, but towards a better um, future. Uh, when we look into the past, because I say for cave, we always look at the past because the past informs the, the problems we have currently and then use those um, things that we dig out from the past on how, um, how to go forward in the future. And the cow corridor was one of those projects we thought that would be the sort of projects that, you know, these funds um, would go to to help create, um, yeah, I guess for a better, a better Africa, so to say, or a better healing. It would be a healing for, for a lot of people. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for your time. Thank you for listening <laughs> to us ramble on about our, our research. Well, we are hoping that you enjoyed um, and have thoughts on what we have presented. Thank you very much, both of you, for an extraordinary talk and um, just sort of mesmerising uh, body of work. And I think kind of fittingly, we got questions actually during, uh, during the talk. So um, uh, one of the people who's asked questions has actually had to leave already so i will ask her question on her behalf and that's jane gibson who says caves are often very private places for the communities that that own them is there a conflict of interest in bringing these places to wider audiences mm. um Yes, um, it's true, like a lot of the spaces uh, within the caves are very sacred to the communities that live around there. Um, there are places even they hold, you know, worship. They worship in some of these spaces. And of course, you wouldn't want a wider audience into such a space, but um, we, we look at it a bit differently rather than you know bringing attention to yes we will be bringing attention to these caves but also there's issues that these people would like addressed um, around those caves for instance the suswa caves um, have been earmarked by the government for more geothermal um, exploration and that means a lot of people will have to be moved from that area as the government moves in to explore and exploit uh, the geothermal um, but then we would need 
to bring this to a wider audience, obviously, to sort of um, get more voices to lobby for such spaces to be protected for the locals that live around these um, caves. Yeah, I, I wouldn't add too much from what Stella said, but yes, these intimate spaces are, um, for us, we look at them as um, spaces we interact with the communities, um, as opposed to advertise them to the world and say, go there as a, you know, a sort of tourist attraction. But we are, we are also conscious that, yeah, some of the work we're doing is exposing them. Uh, out there, um, but I think at the core of our focus is is not to pull in as many tourists as possible. <laughs> it's to allow the communities to dictate what their future is. Um, yeah. We had another question that um, came into the chat uh, from uh, Ruth Morrow, who gave a lecture uh, a few weeks ago in this series. And I think Ruth is has asked another question, I think is, is, is present in the talk still. So um, we'll go to her to ask both of those questions. Ruth, are you there? Yeah, 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 hi. <laughs> Um, I was really brilliant, really fascinating and just uh, amazing to take me out of the space that I'm in and take me to another part of the world. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the cave. That was a really early, I think you even hinted at it, that somehow we could return to the cave. And you also talk about this, uh, what, what was it, reversal future or... Um, Reverse futurism. Reverse futurism, yeah. Which feels like as if you're kind of going back to older, uh, more traditional practices, um, which is which is fascinating and at the same time challenging to think how that might work. C could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? And then uh, I suppose my follow-up question really is that avoiding the mistakes of the past. I mean, obviously any mark that we make um, nowadays, we, we feel its weight in the, in the world, um, mainly because there's so many of us. And we, when we all make marks, that adds up to a considerable weight on the world. So how do you then uh, foresee, you know, making some of these infrastructural projects that you're proposing um, without adding to that weight on the world, yeah. Maybe we can jointly answer that question with Stella. Um, thank you, quite prov provoking questions. Um, I think for us, the reverse futurism um, takes a literal tone. Um, as you highlighted, we talk about returning to the cave uh, as a sort of sum of all parts, uh, if we look at the end game of the Anthropocene, um, we, we might push ourselves to that point of destruction. You look no further um, at uh, the war that's about to, to kick off between Ukraine and Russia, and um, the risks there with nuclear warheads, which also are markers in the anthropogenic uh, timescale, um, and, and what it's saying is that we, we have a propensity to really um, be self-destructive. And um, if you look at the end game of that, it's literally moving back to the cave. And um, with that in mind, um, you almost question uh, our capacity to, 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 to do good on this planet. Um, but with that said, and, and looking back at such propositions as a cow corridor, um, a lot of what we're proposing are extremely limited uh, carbon intensive projects. Uh, we are suggesting that land that's not being used can be used for the population. Um, and these structures and, and follies uh, compose of a very minute 
uh, component to the to the whole um, corridor. But in a way, in terms of, for example, how the project was received, received it was extremely provocative, at least for us. Um, it got a bit of airtime in the media. Uh, we were called non-architects, uh, insane people, don't listen to their crazy ide <laughs> ideas. Um, um, it might not see the light of day, but I think the nature of, of questioning imagination um, within this uh, uh, time of the Anthropocene is so critical. And looking at architectures not being so um, passive and, and subservient to the capitalist and, and neoliberalist pressures of the world um, that require really provocations that question the heart of architectural production. And I, I think part of what we're doing is looking at that space on, on many multiple layers. Um, and, and, and as much as it doesn't end with, okay, final building and okay, here are our cross sections. It's, it's a series of provocations which we feel need to be injected in the discourse uh, that will allow for possibly a, a new mode of, of, of thinking and approaching these very complex problems that we're faced with. Yeah. In a roundabout way. Has I he answered your question? I feel like I won't, I'm not able to add more. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I love hearing both of your voices, actually. I think you, you both speak quite differently about the work. So, I mean, if you have something to add, Stella, please do. But, but um, they, um, yeah. 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 Yes, it's just um, in addition to what um, Kabage has said, yes, it may not be built as we have proposed, but the whole idea of it, we hope would be taken up even by government, you know, because currently, and just um, as an example, just the other day, I don't remember where we were going with driving with Kabage and there was a herd of cattle in on the road and you have to sort of wait for them to move so that you you know continue your journey but it's it's actually a real problem they will come to the city whether um the city you know officials enforce it or not because at the end of the day for the maasai their animals must eat and they will and they're pastoralists by nature that's their way of life they will move their cattle from place to place and so when we, you know, look at these maps um, of Nairobi and look at the chunks of land um, that are owned by government that lay bare, nothing is happening. We have old trains, um, you know, rusting away in these spaces, um, old planes going to die somewhere. But if we could um, sit with some stakeholders in government and private sector and think of ways that we could address the issues um, instead of ignoring them, because I feel like a lot of, of it is ignored, but it's there and we bury our, our heads in the sand. The Maasai will still come with their cattle. You will wait for them in traffic with us and, you know, <laughs> And yeah, it's it's something I think we need to take seriously. And as much as it's a pretty radical um, suggestion, obviously, like the last image you saw with the elevated savanna on 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 a on a road that's currently being constructed, obviously for more traffic, more cars, more uh, pollution, um, we could. I think engage with with different stakeholders to see how to address this, and in that way also just improve um, derelict lands, improve the life of Maasai's, um, and hear them out, listen to them because, yeah, like I keep saying, it's there and they will still come, mm -hmm. whether they get arrested or not. They get arrested a lot but they'll still come. <laughs> and usually it's funny, they'll be arrested on a Friday um, because obviously no government offices will, courts won't be open on Saturday and Sunday. So they spend the weekend in a cell. And on Monday, you'll have to let them go. 
and they'll continue grazing the animals yeah it's quite a story i mean the juxtaposition of the the cow and the the car is is just in your image images is, is quite some revealing in and of itself thank you thank you thanks thanks ruth we need to draw things to a close um very shortly but i, I just wanted to to ask um one one question uh myself before before we do um you know, you know extraordinarily um a thought-provoking um body of work and one of the things that i was i was interested in you know um Stella, you, you concluded the talk talking about how the the past informs the problems we have now but at the same time we can use the past to think about how we go forward in the future and I was really struck by this this notion of reverse futurism and um you know you just sort of talked just a moment ago about this idea of improving derelict land improving lives and I I was wondering you know given the how we talk about the Anthropocene and climate catastrophe you know it's um uh it, it it presents a vision of the future which is not a particularly enticing one put it that way but the way you describe your work is 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 propositional it's optimistic is is that something that's that's conscious i mean architecture itself is you know in a very in very simple terms is a kind of optimistic practice because it's about creating something with the expectation it's going to endure, <laughs> that there is, that, that, that the energy and, and um, money and, and labor expended in something is gonna generate some kind of return, whether that is in a very crude sense, financial, but whether it's social, cultural, whether it's in terms of sort of sustaining human interactions in, 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 a, in a very basic sense. Is it, so do you, do you see what you're doing as, as optimistic are you you know um optimistic about the future in 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 what in what you do wow well, um yes and no it's, it's <laughs> but um yes because these are things obviously nobody um, is talking too much about right now in Kenya. And like Abaga said, we've been called non-architects because of this research that we do, but we feel like there's, there's so much that needs to be um, told. There's so much that needs to be taught, um, so much that needs to be given out to the public so that they actually know. Because I feel like a lot of what is happening right now is people are clueless, um, you know, I, I don't know why I am working really hard to get out of the void to go into a mid space. They don't realize that is something that's been created by past problems and they don't see it as that or like congestion in these informal settlements. They don't think it is something or they don't know, actually that's the better word to use. They don't know that it is something that has been created in the past and that's why they're in this situation. So we're, yeah, maybe let me use the word optimistic that we will be able to get a larger audience, especially within our context in Nairobi and in Kenya, that we will get people thinking um, that you don't need to get out of the void, actually. You can make the void um, as good as the made. And you don't have to struggle to get out. You don't need to have rural um, urban migration because we can make government, make people start thinking about developing whatever it is people come to the urban centers for. So to some extent, yes, we're optimistic um, that, yeah, what the research that we're doing is going to inform some decisions sometime in the future and the reason i would say no we're not optimistic is because we are just starting um it's also something new for us it's something we are discovering every every single day 
um, as we go into the research. And so it's when we sometimes sit with Kabage and think about it, it's so huge, it's almost scary. So that's the bit I would say, no, we're not optimistic because there's so much that needs to be an it's just, you know, the two of us here at CAVE trying to do it. And we're just hoping that a lot more people will get interested and join us in, um, yeah, in unearthing all this and informing the public so that there's more public participation in everything that is done uh, going forward. I think I won't add very much of what Stella said, but I think architecture by its very nature is, an, is a practice in a sort of finite, <laughs> um, finite moment of optimism. I'm, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to encapsulate it, but the tools of our training and our capacities to visualize and uh, consider problems, um, with you know with 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 hindsight or, or solutions at least the way we look at it um the nature of that is very very much optimistic it is at its heart an optimistic profession um but i think it's when now <laughs> which goes back to i think what uh, ruth was highlighting um to do with the challenges of of trying to fix one infrastructure with another infrastructure the op optimism gets carried away, or we get carried away with that optimism, which is effectively, in a way, what modernism is. And um, being able to, or was, should I say, um, being able to unpack that and be considered in terms of what impact really means. Um, um, but I think I'm, I'm really encouraged with um, at least our ability to unpack the issues using architectural uh, language and tools, um, and also present uh, potential ideas or solutions, which may remain in a sort of imaginary, um, but I think have the capacity to, to eventually develop and shape uh, real-time solutions. Um, so it's, it's a really fascinating question. We've never really been asked that. Um, and it's, I think it's a really important one. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, well, thank you so much. We we do need to draw things to a close as we've run over uh, a bit. But thank you, Stella and Kabaga, for a one, wonderful, incredibly stimulating uh, talk and uh, discussion. We pick up the series again next Thursday with uh, V. Mitch McEwen, who is Assistant Professor at Princeton, uh, Director of the University's Architecture and Technology Research Group, Black Box, and co-founder of the New York Design practice atelier office so please do uh, join us uh, for that one next Thursday uh, but thank you again Stella and Gabaga thank you Owen. thank you for having us thank you, thank you very much thank you very much